to Australia and New Zealand. Over to you, Tony. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Money matters, doesn't it? Finance matters for trade. And so, so my talk today is on the financial side of the trade, in particular reference to the Bretton Woods era, 1945 to 1971. And I'll talk, uh, and you'll use Australia as a case study in the discussion, even though the paper has two case studies in there, one for Australia and New Zealand. I want to review free trade sentiment in the Bretton Woods era as it developed, 1945, roughly the, the early 70s. And consider a fact that it's proved to, to be a major obstacle to free a trade in that period. The prevailing international financial architecture as it's possibly commonly known these days or popularly known. Because that factor was one among many that dampened free trade sentiment over that period. Real trade theorists and those interested in matters, day to day matters of trade policy often consider those factors and neglect or keep it to, to, to one side international financial arrangements. In practice, trade finance matters. International finance is inextricably linked to trade policy. Now I want to start with a few quotations. First one from Keynes, 1933. In that statement, in his Economics of Self-Sufficiency, he argues that ideas, knowledge, art, hospitality, travel and so on, these things should be of their nature international, he says. But let goods be homespun whenever it is reasonably and conveniently possible. And above all, and above all, let finance be primarily national. And that's the, that's the thing I want to hone in on in my talk, financial side. Now it's true that Keynes changes his views in the 10 years that follow from 1933. He's persuaded away from the homespun idea over time. And he's persuaded away from the let finance be primarily national by 1943 because Britain's broke. When Britain's broke, maybe finance need not be entirely national. But that's another story. The next quotation is from a leading trade and monetary theorist, a much neglected thinker in American economics, Frank D. Graham, 1943. And the key part of his statement, when he's deliberating on the plans that have been set up or been introduced for the Bretton Woods Conference that was held in 1944, he's saying, main thing in this post-war world is that international finance must be the handmaiden of international trade, not the other way around. And I'll keep coming back to this, uh, this thought as we go along. There's one more, uh, one more quotation early on in the paper at the bottom of the slide that's quite important as well. Ragnar Merksa, the Estonian economist working at the League of Nations just before the Bretton Woods Conference, writes an important book. The International Currency Experience is the title, reflecting on interwar experience with currency, currency markets. And this, the draft of this book is circulated around in draft uh, amongst the delegates of the Bretton Woods Conference. He knows the draft's going to be circulated, so he includes in the book an important statement about the financial side, arguing that there should be less need for the general uses of commercial policy in relation to the balance of payments in any international financial framework that's created post-war. This was his hope. Well, the hope didn't really turn out well. Because in practice, in the Bretton Woods system, the agreement that was created at Bretton Woods that created the system that we know of as the Bretton Woods monetary system, uh, that system often encouraged participants to shade trade policy with a view to protecting their nation's balance of payments using the balance of payments often as a reference point for making trade policy. Now, we know that the GATT agreement was also being developed at the time the Bretton Woods people were meeting on the, on the monetary system, and that's, that agreement was supposed to be the counterpart for the monetary arrangements that were going to come out of Bretton Woods. Now, the GATT agreement had a liberalising spirit on the surface, and of course it would have relative to the kinds of trade restrictions that existed and that were developed in the interwar period. But the GATT agreement was by no means an instrument for free trade. Let's have a quick look at some of the main pillars of the Bretton Woods architecture. We're going to do this in a rather potted way because we don't have a lot of time to go into the details. But the key pillar, or pillars, first, fixed adjustable exchange rates. The system evolved through the 50s to become essentially a fixed rate dollar standard with the US dollar 
anchored to gold at $35 an ounce, and most of the other world's currencies pretty much anchored directly or indirectly to the fixed rate dollar standard. In the case of the Australian and New Zealand currencies, they were fixed pretty much against sterling, which was in turn a part of the fixed rate dollar standard world at the time. Now, in the national sense, fiscal and monetary policy, uh, fiscal policy and incomes policies were used during the Bretton Woods period, 45 to 71, to deal with internal balance, as Trevor Swan wants, wants you know, that concept of the internal economic balance. Monetary policy was used first and foremost to deal with and protect official liquidity or official reserves and the exchange rate, and only secondarily to deal with internal balance matters. Trade finance was generally available through official reserves, official liquidity. That is to say, reserves of our currency held at central banks in a fixed dollar or currency world. There were two types, of, two aspects to official liquidity in the system. First of all, resources held by monetary authorities or central banks to settle deficits on current account. This required central banks to have access to key currencies and sometimes reserve borrowing facilities or conditional facilities from the International Monetary Fund or borrowing facilities from other governments. There was another aspect to official liquidity, another function for it if you like. The reserves had to be used to defend the fixed exchange rates. If there was any pressure on fixed exchange rates, there was sufficient currency reserves at the central bank, for instance, to defend those currency, currencies, especially if there was downward pressure. There's a third aspect to liquidity in this system, you could call it private liquidity, and coupled with official liquidity, this liquidity couldn't move easily across borders. There weren't free capital movements or any, any semblance of free movement of capital across borders in this system. Now let's have a look at the, just for, a, for argument's sake, at the long run profile of international capital movements over a century or so in a rather heroic picture. This the picture is heroic in the sense that the, the authors of the picture, Morris Opsfeld and Alan Taylor, uh, produce a picture of capital movements over the long run, movements of liquidity you might call it, making the very strong assumption that you could measure the degree of capital movements across borders uh, in a single variable, high versus low on the vertical axis, and, num and years on the horizontal axis. And the interesting thing about the picture is that their empirical work tends to confirm the broad picture, the broad pattern of, 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 of capital movements across borders, even though it's a highly stylized picture. The important things to note first, of course, in the gold standard era, capital movements across borders was, were quite high, quite liberal. But then we had the 1914, pretty much through to 1929, even 45 where international capital markets were deeply distrusted and obstacles were put in the way of movements of capital across borders. And in the Bretton Woods era, which is quite important for our deliberations, we see a grudging improvement in capital movements across borders, both official, governmental and private movements. And then, of course, post Bretton Woods, certainly from 1980 onwards, this great expansion of movement across uh, borders of uh, capital, or you might call it liquidity, uh, rather loosely. The other thing to reflect on here is Frank Graham's statement about trade being a handmaiden of finance the other way around. If you have a quick look, and cursory look, at uh, the growth of world trade in these different periods, the growth world trade grew by five times measured in US dollars, adjusted for the number of countries in the world, between 1945 and 71, Bretton Woods era. 25 years or so. The next 25 years, 71 to 96, world trade grows by 11 times. Now, what about Australian trade? I know we do, this is very loose and cursory. In US dollar terms, Australian trade grows by four times in the Bretton Woods era and 19 times in the next 25 years. Now, Frank Graham might say, aha, my suspicion is being confirmed here rather than uh, loosely, that during the Bretton Woods era, trade was the handmaid of international finance. You loosen up international finance and trade takes off. You see? Well, maybe. Let's look at some of the liquidity problems more, more deeply in the Bretton Woods system. I think it has something to do with trade policy and free trade sentiment during this period. The US dollar was scarce 
uh, post-war. The US had a surplus, large surplus, a strong economy. Rather than Bretton Woods Agreement, countries were permitted to discriminate against US imports because they wouldn't get hold of US dollars and hold of US dollars very easily. As the Bretton Woods system evolved, um, criticism emerged through the 50s. Frank Graham, then Milton Friedman, and then later on in the 60s, Harry Jones, arguing that the Bretton Woods system, the WPF, depended on a plethora of exchange controls, on the movement of capital across borders, on the, on the degree of convertibility of currencies and so on, and they, they argued that trade restrictions were there to preserve liquidity, and they were substitutes for more flexible exchange rates. Now, the IMF, right in the mid-60s, and reflecting on the first 15 years of the Bretton Woods system, concluded that, rather disappointingly, that member countries were doing their utmost to avoid deficits and retain surpluses on current account. And they were avoiding currency adjustment as well. Even though the IMF said, right, oh, you can adjust your currency down, but if you've got deficits in the system, countries were having to be persuaded very hard to do any kind of a currency adjustment in that system. Why was this? Well, it was because the system had an inbuilt asymmetric adjustment bias, as the commentators say. That is, most of the adjustment effort was placed on deficit countries. They had to do most of the work in the system. They had to retrench spending. They had to borrow from the IMF in the short term because they weren't allowed to adjust exchange rates. And borrowing from the IMF, the conditions often very onerous. And when they, of course, they do today in currencies, well, they were easily in a crisis. And there were inflationary implications, and they weren't politically popular. So official reserves of liquidity um, kind of acted as a national insurance against small, small open economies like Australia and New Zealand, against the volatility of export receipts. They were a form of national insurance to counter downward pressure on the currency. And reserves were also a way of avoiding having to go cap and hand to the IMF for conditional finance, so that you wouldn't uh, adjust your currency in the short run. The other problem is that holding large excessive reserves of liquidity in the central bank had high opportunity costs. So you needed to get, countries needed to get to the optimal level of reserves. Uh, and this was not an easy thing to do. Uh, and, and work out great minds were, were, were put on the subject of what would be the optimal level of reserves for a small open economy that's trading internationally. Well, great minds in Australia, Heinz Arndt, Murray Kent, write very uh, important technical articles on this problem. But it wasn't an easy process. Trade restrictions, however, were much easier. You resort to those restrictions, you can build up reserves, avoid reserve losses, and then avoid having to go to the IMF cap in hand for short-term financing. Well, that's a point of version of the Bretton Woods system. Let's have a look at, in that context, at the mainstream, called mainstream Australian trade policy ideas 1950 and 60. First of all, the resort to quantitative controls in the early 50s. You go to the archives, what are the officials saying? They're saying, reserves are falling. We've got to do something, we've got to do it quickly. We've got time to think about the science of uh, tariffs, restrictions. Um, reserves are falling, let's slap on quantitative import controls to protect, protect the liquidity position. The level of reserves in 1952 was used as an official reference point for that kind of trade policy action. 1956, four years later, an even deeper recession in Australia, a much Right, foreign reserves, and again, really, the officials, treasury. We need to uh, raise quantitative controls. Quick action to deal with a, a, an emergency in the reserves. Now we have Max Gordon writing in 1958 about the need to perhaps use a flexible uniform tariff. Much simpler, not as distortionary as quantitative controls. Ignore me. Why? We'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll have an argument for why a bit later on. The focal point in the 50s was preserve foreign exchange, not create more foreign exchange by expanding and diversifying exports. The basic idea was preserve foreign exchange, then it's a problem for the long term. Substitute domestic production of manufactured goods for imports. Australia, after all, is a developing country. 
This is the consensus view. So the infant industry case applies. And the infant industry case is used in the official deliberations. Tariff regime, you've got one, it's high, it's, 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 it's declining in terms of its extent, as you saw with, with Peter's uh, um, pictures. But overall, we need a fairly high tariff regime for long term industrialisation. So, in the 1950s, the idea of freer trade was really sacrificed with the onset of the liquidity problem with the foreign exchange constraint in the minds of the officials. Again, 1960s. What's the uh, mainstream line, if I can call it that, mainstream line of thinking? Rising reserves in the 1960s. Rising reserves, reference points straight away from the Treasury to write to the Treasury and say, oh, reserves are rising, they're solid, we can now get rid of the quantitative controls that we've, we've, we've put on in the 50s. Uh, and, and the policy makers agree. There's balance of payments pessimism in this period. Um, that, that was really uh, developed in the 50s and it continues into the 60s. It was thought that rural production couldn't do much, it, it couldn't really increase it very much, exports couldn't be diversified, there was pessimism about uh, developing a variety of new markets. And I think Commonwealth preference had a big role to play here. If you're pretty much trading in that narrow uh, channel of the Commonwealth, and you're looking out, well, you know, if that, that's the basic ambit of our ability to, to, to trade, then uh, you can be pessimistic. And that pessimism persisted through the 60s. Existing and in, 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 in diversified uh, markets, just Existing markets were there, there were the Commonwealth markets, diversification wasn't particularly uh, likely. But then you could also make the excuse, which is common, with policy making and, and amongst politicians, that if your trading partners are not open, why should you be? Why should you be an island of free trade, as they said, in a, in a world of controls? The Vernon Report pretty much repeats the sentiment. It's well discussed, the 1965 Vernon Report had crystallised the consensus on trade policy at this time. And it's really interesting to go back and look through the reviews. There's an historian of economic school, or Australian and New Zealand economic school, and there you see Max Gordon in his review, very politely putting it. Matter of fact, the Vernon Report was firmly pretentious, 1966, in, in Max's review. It, as an aside, the the economists at the time who weren't in the mainstream, and I include Max in that group, were very polite in their criticisms. Nowadays, you might be hammering the desk, but as an economist, in those days, the, the economists were terribly polite. And some more examples of that politeness in the middle. Plant industrialisation, import substitution, again, was the main theme of that official report. They recognised, um, oh, oops, not the bride really well, can't get to the bride yet. They recognised the lesson from Max's idea of the, of the, of the development of the idea of the effective rate of protection. Uh, the calculations in the Vernon Report, the early ones on the effective rate of protection for different industries, that was wonderful work. I mean, you could say this is an advance in thinking. And you get the sense that they did understand that it was quite possible, coming out of that effective rate of protection work, that attacks on imports could well up they end up being a tax on exports. And that's not good for Australia. But it's a slight hit, it's the sense you get. They don't take that to its logical conclusion. They supported the infant industry case, as you would expect. Australia is still a developing country in the 1960s. Uh, and they supported the uh, high rates of tariff protection because planned industrialisation is the way to go. That helps you preserve foreign exchange. Ignore the distributional consequences of protection, especially on exporters, but also on low income households. Not much discussion in the Berman Report on that sort of thing. That comes later, in the 1980s, when economists turn their, their attention to the effects of protection on the different classes in society. But underneath it all is the idea that should achieve full employment, come what may, as immediately as possible, regardless of the costs. That's the key political, political economic objective. Full employment in the short run, given the effects of the state of the world, architecture that you're operating as a nation. Another criticism, Brian Redway, Australian economist at Cambridge, famous for his review of the general theory, Cain's general theory. He comes 
just in company. He writes a review of the Vernon Report. He asks this simple question in relation to the infant industry case. Do you think that the arguments about protecting an infant, in infant economy, widening the range of employment opportunities, and the transition from an agricultural to an industrial society are very apt to Australia's present position with 12% of the labour force of primary production? He doesn't answer the question. He doesn't need to. It's such a polite criticism. Yet again, I would have added only 12% with exclamation marks. He doesn't need to, to make his point. The other review that I found important uh, of the Vernon Report uh, in relation to the liquidity issue is Jim Perkins' report. Jim was at the University of Melbourne. <coughs> now, he argues that the report's point that Australia should rely on least foreign capital to keep its restrictions on private capital movements into the country um, he said, well, the consequences of this idea are explained. One of the main consequences are the trade-offs that are implied for living standards in Australia. It would be low growth, not higher growth. And this was a self-imposed financial constraint. Not consistent, he said, with Australia's potential productive capacity to generate long-run gains from trade by expanding that capacity. So again, the liquidity issues in there um, in some of the criticisms. We come to the 70s, and it's quite a, a, a tempestuous period of the 70s for trying to, if you wanted to try and distill the mainstream view, because the mainstream is starting to shift. Bretton Woods system is breaking. That's the international financial context, and that's important. It's breaking. 73, we have reserves swelling, surplus, inflation. 25% tariff cut off them called the Whitlam cuts. They're not really, well, the Whitlam cuts are right, politically speaking, but they're Fred Bruin's cuts. Fred Bruin, <coughs> one of the advisors to, to Whitlam, an economic economist uh, in the vanguard of the liberalisation movement in the, in the 70s, gets through this point that, you know, cutting tariffs is a better way to go in dealing with a surplus um, and inflation as well. 74, though, reserves are collapsing. Oh, another key reference point for a policy change, you might think. In the 50s or 60s, the, res the reflex action would have been raise your quantitative restrictions. It's an emergency. No, the price mechanism suddenly comes into, into vogue. Well, we can now adjust the exchange rate without having to go, having to, go to the IMF for a sanction. Um, or maybe a devaluation. Maybe even float the currency. Jim Cairns, Minister of Trade wanted to float the currency. Why? He says, if we floated the currency, this would improve the competitiveness of domestic production. The Reserve Bank response in the Bretton Woods model. This is the archives are worth reading for this. The, just with these, with these, these tidbits of um, knowledge coming out in the contrast. The Reserve Bank says, well, hang on, the level of official reserves for which the RBA is responsible must primarily be the target of exchange rate management. You see? Reserves matter. We've got to manage the exchange rate. We don't want it to be floated. And after all, Australia doesn't have sophisticated financial markets. So we should retain our ability to control that rate and not allow it to float. So they end up debating this for a while, backwards and forwards. Minister of Overseas Trade, Treasury Reserve Bank supporting We'll go with the devaluation. We don't like the tariffs. The tariffs are increases the distortion. Rare price change might help. We'll do the 12% devaluation. So policy advisors, at least in the mid 70s, are starting to talk about floating the currency and making it more flexible. They're taking their time. They're behind the rest of the world, at least the rest of the industrial world, in this regard. Now, there's one person I'd like to pay particular tribute to in this liberalisation movement in the early 70s in relation to the financial side of the issues. And this is Richard Snape, a student of, of Max's. I'm here today because of Richard's influence, no question about that. But he was in the vanguard very early on of the liberalisation movement on the financial side. In 1970, he writes an article with a question mark entitled, A Foreign Exchange Market for Australia in the Economic Report. He looks right out there. What was for the 1970s? 
For people here, young people here, the idea that Australia didn't have a foreign exchange market in any sense in 1970, except for the official Reserve Bank one, would seem incomprehensible. And we have Richard Snake writing this article, maybe we should play the currency. We've got a we could develop a very sophisticated foreign exchange market very quickly in Australia. And by the way, he says in a number of other articles in the 70s, why don't we open up the capital account of the balance of payments to give Australia access to more foreign capital? Especially, we need to reduce controls on inward foreign direct investment. Australia's attitudes, and Australian attitude to foreign direct investment in the 1970s was not especially liberal. And so some of these ideas that Richard was developing in his articles in the 70s were very progressive, looking back, but also very radical at the time. Again, it wasn't really listened to until uh, the 1980s. Well, the impeccable logic of positive economics and of and the evidence that was provided on trade restrictions uh, in Australia and New Zealand in the 60s and 70s pretty much ignored in policy making. Pretty much. Why was this? And Peter Lloyd did some early work on New Zealand in the 70s, I think, pointing to the uh, exaggerated benefits of protection, the other side of the coin. And a lot of this positive economics work was pretty much with people sending the same message. Well, I think it was because the Bretton Woods system that Australia and New Zealand were operating in, the overarching financial architecture was financially repressive in the sense that the imperative of reserve maintenance and preservation was a key consideration in policy making. Trade restrictions were a means of preserving scarce liquidity, of responding to what was thought to be, and the term often was used, the foreign exchange constraint. We don't use that term anymore. The export gap was the other common phrase. We have an export gap. We don't use that term anymore either. So overall, uh, employment goals matter, there's no question. Long-term competitiveness, well that's for something to think about on, this, on the margins in the long run. Trade policy overall in the Bretton Woods era was periodically subordinated to reserve requirements. That's basically my story. And so, <coughs> in conclusion I guess, my argument, looking at the New Zealand and Australian cases and the policy, and the policy deliberations that were going on in the archival material, the Bretton Woods liquidity constraint, including the capital controls, especially on private capital movements, imposed a kind of inferior equilibrium on world trade, but also, in particular, on Australian trade. The system also placed constraints on thought and action during this period. It retarded free trade sentiment. Now, in the 1970s, when the United States threw open its financial markets, opened its capital account, and allowed much greater flexibility in its exchange rate, a new international monetary framework was beginning to take place. One that eventually led to policies of financial openness, financial capital mobility, market determined exchange rates, and much greater financial integration worldwide in the last 20 years of the last century. Now, the external financial constraint still exists. It hasn't gone away, but it's not called the liquidity constraint anymore. The external financial constraint is still there for Australia in the sense that the nation has a national creditworthiness constraint, not a liquidity constraint. And creditworthiness must ultimately be linked to Australia's capacity to repay. It's intertemporal wealth constraint. In other words, it's linked to the ability of the nation's residents to generate gains from trade in the long run. Now, coming back to Keynes' statement that I introduced at the beginning. As against Keynes, in a world of greatly liberalised, if not free trade, in a world where you need expanding international trade and expanding economic development, especially in countries outside the, outside the core industrial countries, then finance cannot always or generally be national. Unlike the financial functions of capital in the Bretton Woods system that we briefly talked about here, the developments that followed the collapse of that system ushered in reforms in international finance that made finance the handmaiden of international trade in an emphatic way, just as Frank Graham had argued should be the case in the 1940s. From the 1980s, 
the free trade policy reforms that were seen in trade in Australia and much later in New Zealand were not only assisted by those international financial reforms, they wouldn't have been possible, in my mind, without those reforms. <coughs>